Hello. Welcome to the first year BHM course of Guru Nanak Institute of Technology, Kolkata. I'm Dr. Indrajit Bose, and I shall be your course coordinator for this session. This paper is entitled Business Communication with the Paper Code of BHM N102. In the course of this paper, we are taking a look at the various forms, genres, and modes of communication in the workplace context, especially with reference to the hospital and the healthcare industry. Now, this lecture is lecture 10 in the series, and it is based on the theory which informs the whole process of communication exchange in the interaction or the interpersonal exchanges between the management professional in hospitals and the general public and other people in the medical profession. So we shall look at this meaning and process of communication in the course of this lecture. Now basically, when you talk about a hospital management professional, what sort of interaction comes to your mind. You will have to think about interacting with doctors, for example. So doctors will be asking you about the history of their patients. So they might bring you up and ask you about it. So you will have to maintain the patient healthcare history. Insurance providers, medical insurance providers might ask you for information about patients. So again, you will have to keep that. Again, the administration might question you about the finances of patients and the billing. As far as patient billing is concerned or meeting of medical expenses and doctor's bills are concerned. Again, people looking after the infrastructure of the hospital, they will also be connected with you. So you can understand that written communication via phone, to emails, you will constantly be engaging in interpersonal interaction with people belonging to the medical profession, with doctors, nurses, other medical professionals, with caregivers, Again, with the patients and their families, with people in the administration, even the broad general public. So there are lots of types of interpersonal exchanges and it is very significant what you will communicate with them on a day-to-day -day basis. So you have to know what really lies behind this process of communication, what communication is and what it involves. So in our lecture today, we should be looking at the concept of communication, trying to define communication, look at its nature and characteristics, its importance and scope, and explore the process of communication and see how it can be made more effective. Now, I think we can begin at a basic point of the nature of man in society. Basically, man is a social animal. That is how Aristotle, the ancient Greek thinker, defined man. And we could say that basically, man is outgoing and sociable and <coughs> thrives through exchanging ideas, emotions, and feelings with other people. So basically, man has the tendency or proclivity to convey to others his basic feelings, desires, and fears. And this kind of exchange or sharing with others also brings a sense of relief or joy to him. For example, when you have written something good, let's say in a letter, and you get a, an enthusiastic response.
from the person you wrote that letter to. Or you put a Facebook post and you get a lot of likes on that post. So you feel tremendously enthused. So if one is successful as a communicator, it brings a sense of confidence and joy, naturally. But of course, we may or may not always be successful in communication. So some people are very good as communicators. They can string their messages along well. They can use the right channels at the right time and get their meaning across in a wonderful way. Other people who are not able to do these things may be poor communicators and they may even fail in communication attempts. But basically, communication arises because of man's need for exchanging thoughts, ideas, feelings with others. And we should also note that out of this process of exchange or out of this need for sharing has emerged something very, very special, and that is language. So language is a specialized means of exchange or interaction which has emerged out of this process of communication. At first, of course, man did not have language. In fact, early on, men communicated through signs or through pictures or drawings. If you talk about prehistoric man, then he drew pictures on the walls of the caves where he lived. <clears throat> uh, by looking at those pictures or studying those pictures, we can understand or we can uh, get an inkling of his feelings and his fears and desires. Then, people belonging to civilizations like the Egyptians, for example, had a hieroglyphic script by which they expressed their thoughts and ideas. And that has been deciphered later on. Then, of course, man developed language as a specialized tool of communication and over the years and centuries man has been perfecting that and in fact it has become something highly specialized and developed in communication exchanges. Now <clears throat> therefore we can say that basic to communication is the idea of sharing or interchange, exchange or partnership. Now the word communication comes from the Latin word communis, which means common. Now there have been various definitions of communication given by the experts. I think we should take a look at some of these definitions to understand what is the process of communication and what is communication actually in a proper way. Now here we is G. G. Brown's definition. Let's start with what Brown has to say. I'm reading out. Communication is the transfer of information from one person to another, whether or not it elicits confidence. But the information transferred must be understandable to the receiver. Or in other words, the point that we are getting from this is communication is basically a process of information transfer. This is done from one person to another person. And this information transferred must be understood by the other person. Okay, now here there is a technical term which is used, the receiver. The person who initiates the communication exchange is called the sender, and the person at the other end who receives the communication is called the receiver. So, the basic point is that if communication is done without the transference of meaning, or if the person to whom the communication is done is not able to understand what is communicated, then we can say that communication has not been successful. Let us look at some more definitions. Now, Newman and Summer define communication thus. Communication is an exchange of facts, ideas, opinions, or emotions by two or more persons. So once again, we are getting a whole gamut of feelings and ideas that exchange facts, ideas, opinions, or emotions. So that is all what is exchanged. Again, it may be between two or more persons. What about Alan Lewis's definition now? 
Communication is the sum of all the things one person does when he wants to create understanding in the mind of another. It involves a systematic and continuous process of telling, listening, and understanding. Okay, so what are the points in this definition? Communication is the sum of all the things one person does when he wants to create understanding in the mind of another. So naturally, the whole process is starting with one person wishing to communicate something by saying something to another person and he wants to get that across to the other person. It involves a systematic and continuous process of telling, listening, understanding. Telling on the part of the person who is speaking or who is transferring, listening on the part of the receiver who is responding, and understanding on the part of the receiver, which gives a response back to the sender. Now we shall look at one more definition of communication, which is a very seminal one, and it is extremely well put and illustrated. So let us read this. This is by Keith Davis. Let's see what Keith Davis has to say about communication. Communication is the transfer of information and understanding from one person to another person through thoughts, ideas, opinions, and values. It is the bridge of meaning among people to which one can surmount the river of misunderstanding that sometimes separates people. So what are the key points uh, that emerge out of this definition? First of all, communication is an information transfer that can take place between one person and another person. What is exchanged is thoughts, ideas, opinions, values, etc. And additionally, Keith Davis wonderfully puts or conveys across two metaphors. One is the bridge of meaning. So communication is like a bridge. It brings people together. It unites people. And misunderstanding is like a river. It's like the river after the monsoons puts paint, which washes everything away. So misunderstanding or miscommunication is like a river which disunites and separates people. So I think certain points have emerged from these definitions of communication. If we look at more definitions, I think the same points will be repeated in different ways. So what are these points? Let us quickly recap. Communication is a process. It is a process of transference of thoughts, ideas, opinions, values from one person to another person. This process is accompanied by the exchange of meaning also. And communication is something which unites people brings people together. So there is a great unifying force in communication. Now, let us explore certain features and characteristics of communication. Communication is a process, we've already said that, and it is a two-way process. In other words, it is a two-way street. Something is given and something is obtained as a result of that. So it's never a one-way process. It will never be a single street. It's never a blind, a blind lane. So you will always give something and receive something back in return. It is also purpose oriented. So there can be nothing like purposeless communication. There is always an underlying purpose or central meaning in this exchange. And it is essentially purposeful. Again, it is meaning driven. So in other words, there is a central or centrality of meaning which is involved in this communicative exchange and you can say that conveying this meaning across is at the base of the mind of the person who is sending it across. Again, okay? it is both overt and overt. In other words, not only what we get from the outside but there are also inner meaning but there may be a plurality of meaning. And it also includes psychological elements like submerged thoughts, ideas, and feelings, which are called the hidden data of communication. So they also influence the communication process. So I should be giving a small example over here to explain this idea. Let us see. Let's say that there is an interview that is going on and the interview has started well. The candidate is feeling quite confident and answering the questions put by the interviewer. Suddenly, the interviewer starts asking 
hostile questions or negative questions and the candidate cannot understand why this change has suddenly taken place. The candidate is unable to understand and the interview ends on an unsatisfactory note. The candidate is very depressed. Now, why did this change take place? Actually, when the candidate was being asked questions, he mentioned something about his personal background. Now, some fact, which is something that the interviewer dislikes, or in other words, the interviewer has a personal dislike of something, which the candidate mentioned in his personal past. And because of this, the candidate was subjected to these hostile questions by the interviewer immediately after this point in the interview. And the interview started going all wrong. So it was as a result of the prejudice of the interviewer. But this is not something which should be there. It's not something that can be pinpointed by the candidate or by anybody else, because it is something hidden in the mind or in the subterranean consciousness of the interviewer. So we can see that it is in this way often that psychological ideas, submerged thoughts and feelings, psychological elements influence the process of communication. Now communication can be both intrapersonal as well as interpersonal. Intrapersonal, that is communication with oneself. If I keep a diary or journal, then necessarily I'm communicating with myself. Interpersonal, so suppose I exchange ideas with my colleague during a department meeting, or I send an email to somebody who is a vendor in my company, or I give a presentation to somebody in a departmental meeting. So these are all interpersonal modes of communication and interaction. There can also be diverse channels, media, and modes. So one can use the public media channels like radio, television, or internet, and also social media like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, in order to interact with members of the public, with patients, with uh, medical insurance companies, healthcare sector workers, pharmaceutical companies, and so on. So you will find that uh, increasingly the the job or the role that you are going to take up in your workplace later on will involve a lot of use of these media and channels. So we'll have to make proactive use of this media. Now communication can be one to one or one to many, or in fact, many to many. Like suppose when you are interacting with your colleague in a department meeting, it is one to one, or when it is one person who is giving a sales presentation to an audience, that's one to many. But again, they can be many to many, like a team of doctors talking in a talk show, which is being broadcast via satellite. Now, human communication also differs from non-human or animal communication. In fact, animals and birds have their own language and scientists have studied them, but that is different from human language. And apart from language, there can also be, as I have said, pictorial communication or communication through signs and symbols. If you are proficient in computer science, you will be able to use various computer codes and you will know coding. Now, what is the scope of communication? This is something to be considered before we move on to the process of communication as such. Now, communication, of course, is not confined to the surrounding or the local context. In fact, it extends beyond the frontiers, extends across nationalities, borders, and racial boundaries. Nowadays, as a matter of fact, in the 21st century, communication is global and international in scope. As a result of emerging technology and the internet and the spread of digital media, communication has become international in scope. And there is a tremendous expansion and widening of boundaries. So you as a healthcare professional may not be confined to just the state of this thing on. You might be interacting with other healthcare professionals across India, in Bangalore, in Hyderabad, in New Delhi, and also other professionals in other countries and continents, like in Europe, in East Asia, in Australia, or USA, and so on. 
So communication is extremely wide ranging in scope and it is quite international and global in scope as a matter of fact in the 21st century. The importance of communication can hardly be underestimated. It is what makes human life possible, helps us in understanding global needs, enriches interpersonal relations, and provides a better way of getting messages across to other people. In fact, we can say that communication or better communication increases or enhances productivity and it reduces stress. It's a great stress buster, as a matter of fact. And if we communicate better, we also work better. Now, I would like to go on to look at the process and the modes of communication. So we shall look at the communication process and certain media and modes of communication. Now, we have said that communication is basically a process, so it is never static. It is always taking place. It is always dynamic. It is always going on. Though we can say it is just for a simple information exchange take place, the time taken is a certain fraction of a second. So communication is something which is constantly ongoing and it is really fast. It moves at lightning speed. But there may also be barriers which disrupt this communication process at any point. In fact, it has been estimated that around 75% of the communication that we make is miscommunication. Now, what are these barriers? Well, we will come to them. But first, we have to understand what is this process of communication at all in the first place. Now, there are certain elements in communication in the process which are constant. What are these? One is the sender or communicator. The sender is one who communicates or initiates the process of communication. The receiver or the communicatee is the one who receives the communication. And the message is what is transmitted, which can include information, facts, feelings, thoughts, or ideas. So we can say that communication is the process of transference or information exchange in which the sender or communicator communicates something to the receiver or communicatee and the message is what is communicated and it is done with understanding. Now, here we have a diagrammatic representation of the whole process of communication. Now, the sender has the idea first, then the sender puts the idea in the form of a code, which is called encoding, and then transmits that through a channel to the receiver. And the receiver then decodes it or makes sense of it and sends some feedback back to the sender. So the feedback that the receiver gives to the sender is called the feedback loop. So this is the process, basically. Now let us look at the explanation of the process in greater detail. The first stage, when the sender first has the idea about this whole information exchange in his or her mind, this is called ideation. At this stage, there are only thoughts which are formed and obviously I can, cannot communicate my thoughts unless I put that in the form of language or something which can be understood by other people. So the ideas have to be put into the form of a code and code, the code is something which should be understood and transmitted and decoded. So this code may be language or something else. So the idea in the encoded form is transmitted across and this is called the process of transmission. Now the receiver takes it out of the code or deciphers it from the code as it is called. This is called the process of decoding. Now once the receiver has decoded the message and make, make sense of the message, then the, the receiver can give an appropriate feedback back to the sender. So then the feedback is sent across from the receiver side back to the sender side. In fact, you can say that this uh, feedback that we have is essential for effective communication. Now, there are several types of feedback that are possible. For example, let me give you some examples. Let us say that uh, you are working in a multi-speciality hospital as a management training. Now, you will be given 
some notes by your supervisor about feedback on the way that you are conducting yourself during the training period. Okay, so that is your supervisor's feedback. Again, okay? you might have to give a feedback form to patients in which patients will rate you on a scale of 1 to 10 or 1 to 5 about various aspects of your administrative control, your healthcare support, your patient care, your consideration for them, and other things, your technical expertise. So patients will give you ratings. And then from an analysis of these patient feedback forms, you might arrive at certain conclusions. Again, the administration might do an appraisal or an annual appraisal of you as, the, as an employee every year, and they might fill up a form. They might ask you to look at a form which they have filled up about data regarding your administrative control in the organization. So that will give you a kind of uh, feedback about your administrative abilities. Okay. Again, from finance, you might get some feedback about your abilities to manage finances. So there are different kinds of feedback that you will be dealing with. So feedback can be of different types. There can be positive feedback or what went well. So many patients might write that they had a very positive experience. Or it can be negative feedback, what did not go so well. So maybe you can have a question that you ask your patients that what were a few things which did not go so well with you during your stay in the hospital. So they might mention a few factors. What is the utility of that? So that you can introspect and improve upon those risks. Again, there is negative feed forward. That is things that need really no repetition or positive feed forward, things that would improve future performance. Actually, this is something which is always very much tied up with the process of feedback. And, uh, we are always trying to improve ourselves with the help of the feedback that we receive from others. So when I'm in the training process and I get my training notes from my supervisor or trainer, then I will look at those points of what is not going so well and try to build up or consolidate from there, try to remedy the problem areas. So one very important role of the feedback that we get is to look at the performance in a new light. So this is something that we are always supposed to do. So be careful about the collecting of feedback. Always be open to feedback from others and pay attention to what others are saying and feeling about you and look at this feedback not as a means of expressing criticism about your actions but as a way of improving upon yourself in future endeavors. So feedback has a very, very positive role to play in the long term as far as our individual performance or communication is concerned. Now again, choosing the appropriate media or the right media for communication is very, very important. Now the message or the feedback needs appropriate structuring. So I might uh, say that, uh, oh, I didn't like this hospital. Uh, I didn't like some of the food that you serve your people. But uh, is that really expressed in a very structured kind of way? No, it is not. It's just a kind of random remark made by a patient. So that, of course, cannot be taken in a very structured way. In order to get the structured feedback, I need to have a feedback mechanism. Like, for example, I have a proper feedback form, which I ask the patients to fill up. And then I preserve the copies of that form, or I make an analysis on the basis of the feedback forms that my patients fill up and give to me. Okay? Or I might take, you know, short audio clips or video clips of what the patients are saying. And again, put them in a file, which will be arranged in a sequential kind of way. So again, you need the appropriate structuring of the feedback. And of course, the media selection. So is it a video that you want? Or is it an audio file? Or 
would you like to keep a hard copy of the feedback? Whatever is appropriate for you, you need to think it out. Especially if you are in the administration in a large hospital, then your feedback certainly has got to be structured. It has got to be preserved well and documented in the system. And you need to keep a copy of the feedback from all sides. So unstructured feedback is not of much value if you are in the administration. It mostly has to be structured and arranged in a very, very systematic way. So patient feedback reports, healthcare reports, records of the administration, administration feedback from there, you all need to keep all this in a very, very systematic way. And there can be verbal as well as non-verbal feedback, certainly, and it can be transmitted written or electronic modes. So I can convey the feedback through letters, emails, bulletins, news feed, or surveys, or phone calls, or news reports. These are all examples of feedback. So at some point of time or the other, all of them are going to be there in your day-to-day -day interaction with the workplace, and you will need to keep a track of all of them. Now, the feedback needs to be constructive as far as possible, but of course, if there is any negative feedback, don't take it in a negative light. Try to take certain action points from the feedback and try to make something constructive out of it. Even if you get negative feedback, do not be disheartened, but try to get something positive out of it and try to rebuild what is going wrong find, by finding out what are the areas or weaknesses which you are susceptible to so that you can troubleshoot and remedy those problems in the near or distant future. Now, effective communication is really the need of the hour. And of course, as a hospital management employee, living in the public eye, living in front of the public media, you will need to be a very effective communicator in the future. And various stakeholders will all be involved with you in this process of interpersonal exchange or communication, which makes your day-to-day -day work in the hospital and the healthcare sector possible. Now, you always need to improve upon yourself. Even if you are a good speaker or writer, doesn't mean that you cannot improve upon your communication skills or ability. So content always needs to be upgraded and improved. Always you need to get better and better and more improved content. Also, you need better structuring. So if your data is not structured in the proper way, please structure it well and select the media appropriately. So does, do you need to keep your files as backup in the cloud or will you keep uh, media files on your computer or system? So what you should do, which kind of media you need to tap? Or will you interact with your patients through the social media broadcast, right to Facebook or WhatsApp? Okay, you need to decide upon these factors. Also, you need a lot of appropriate training in order to improve upon your communication skills. And uh, certainly, you will get induction training and periodical training workshops will be held from time to time in your future workplace. Now, you will have to improve both written and spoken communication through these workshops and interaction, interactive exchanges that take place from time to time. Now, in fact, you'll be able to make more meaningful and effective communication through the selection of better language, modes, and by of course, minimizing the barriers and filters in the process of communication. So let's say that you have to streamline the process of patient admission. So you communicate across to your patients the way that you are simplifying this process of admission by sending a WhatsApp message to them, giving certain guidelines about the admission process. So this is a way of minimizing the confusion and the trouble that patients face when they are confronted with the spectacle of having to admit themselves 
somewhere. So lots of barriers and filters can be surmounted by using effective communication media, using the right channels, using enriched content, and communicating with the people with whom you need to communicate at the right time, at the right place, at the right moment. So it's all a question of appropriateness. So should you interact with these people at this point of time? Or is this the way that you should interact with them? Please think about it and choose the appropriate channels, media and modes of communication so that you can make your communication or interaction more effective and come across as a good hospital management professional. So I hope that in the course of this lecture, I have been able to elucidate both the meaning and the process of communication and that from here we will go on to understand more about the workings of a hospital and the roles played by a healthcare sector employee. So this brings us to the end of the present lecture. Thank you.